I, uh, we've been talking uh, for a number of weeks here about, uh, about this race that we're in. Um, as Paul talks to us about, we're in a race and we need to run it to win. The idea that uh, there's a lot of uh, endurance that's needed in order to finish this race and to finish it well. And, and we've talked about that a lot. And I, I feel um, the Lord uh, kind of a, a, a change of direction here. Um, as we've kind of finished that up, I want to start a new series. And the, the title of it, and again, I'll probably get into a couple. I mean, this, I'm, I'm here for a couple of weeks, then gone for a while, and then we'll we probably pick it back up in January possibly. But, uh, but I, want to, I want to talk about this, this word right here. What's happening? Que pasa? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening in our world? What's happening? What's the biblical response to everything that's going on? And so I want to take a look at the scriptures as we, as we look at all of the events that have happened in our world everywhere. And if you have something you'd like me to, to, to research and look into, please uh, email me at uh, phil at livingfaithfellowship.com. And uh, I'd love to be able to, to research even more into that particular thing and talk about what does the Bible say about certain things. And we're going to talk about a, a number of things. And again, It'll probably hit a lot in January as well. So <clears throat> what does the Bible say about certain things? Now, you have to understand that as we talk about issues that are facing our nation or issues uh, that, are, that are out there, that there are opposing opinions on all of this, okay? So I'm sure as I speak, I will probably ruffle some feathers. That's not my intent. I'm not trying to rub the fur backwards. I, I, I'm not trying to do that in any way. My intent is, if you know me, is I'm not here to offend you. I don't want to offend you in any way. I want to encourage you. I want to, I want to encourage you in your walk with the Lord to go after Jesus to, with all of your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. That's what we're to do. <clears throat> but there are things out there people are asking, what about, what about, what about? And so I want to give, I want to give thoughts. I want to give some biblical perspective on what the scriptures have to say. Now, you may not agree with what I'm saying, and my, my job isn't to try to get you to agree with I'm, what I'm trying to say. My job is to get you to dive into the scriptures and make sure that what you're doing is based upon what the scriptures are talking about, and that you have rationale for what you're believing, what you're moving toward, and all of that. Rather than just listening to the talking heads that are out there, I'd rather, live t I'd rather listen to this talking head, this one right here. I'd rather know what the Bible has to say about things. It doesn't talk to them directly, but it does talk about things somewhat indirectly, directly and indirectly as well. So we're gonna dive into some of those things. So please uh, uh, bear with me, uh, give me a little bit of grace as we move through things. Uh, as I said, my heart is to, is to encourage you and to continue to grow all of us in the things of the Lord. I know that today in our society is very divisive. I, I don't want to do that. I'm not trying to bring division in any way. I want to make sure that we understand one another and move forward. So we're going to talk about some of those aspects. So if you'll please stand, we're going to start with this in our subject matter, 1 Chronicles 12, 32. Say it with me. Of the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, their chiefs were 200, and all their brethren were at their command. Amen, you may be seated. You're probably going, wow, okay. So there's 200 whatever going on here. What's happening here is King David, um, who had been the king of Judah for about seven years, now is becoming king of all of Israel. And all of Israel has gone to Hebron to, to welcome him and to invite him to, if you will, coronate him as the king of the whole land, which we will do for another, what, 30, 33 years, 40 years total that he's the king. But here's what's happening. They're bringing him back in. And so they're, they're talking about all the different tribes that are bringing him back. Because it was just Judah right now. Now they're talking about all the other tribes and the, and, and the people that they brought there to bring him back as the king of, of, of the whole land, switching it from Saul to David. And, 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 and it's interesting that as they put this out, and, they, and most of them, they're just telling who they are, uh, how many people are coming and all that, but they put an interesting parenthetical in this particular uh, uh, verse when it's talking about Issachar. 
of the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. To know what Israel ought to do. They put that parenthetical in there. Why? I think it's very important. I think it's very, very important. The word Issachar, it's interesting. <clears throat> that uh, Hebrew word means he will bring a reward. Issachar, he will bring a reward. It comes from a word that means salary or fair or compensation or benefit or benefit. And I think there's something here that those that understand the times and knowing what to do has great value today. I think it has great value all the time. Have you ever had an issue happen in your life? All of a sudden some dominoes are falling and you just don't know what to do? That doesn't feel very good, does it? What happened and what do I do now is very perplexing. So understanding what happened and knowing what to do can be a very great value to you at that moment. I think us in our nation today, it has great value to us to, to understand that. The sons of Issachar, they did two things, and I think it's needed in the church today. I think it's needed in America today. First of all, understanding of the times. They knew what was going on. They knew what was going on. And I believe now more than ever, we need to understand the times that we are living in. They're very interesting times. Some call them the end times. I'm not saying that at all, but I'm saying something's wrapping up. We are definitely closer to the end times today than we were yesterday. I do know that. I do know that for a fact. But I believe this, that in these times, God doesn't want us ignorant. He wants us understanding. He doesn't want us ignorant, just going with the flow, whatever's happening. Hey, stuff's happening, just go with it. It's happening, so we just went with it. Instead, hey, wait, things are happening, but should I go with that? Should I, should I, should I be going with that or should I be going, wait, 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 wait a second. I don't know I can go with that. I don't know that that's the direction we're supposed to go. I don't know that I'm just supposed to go with the flow. I think maybe at times God's saying, stand up against the flow. Stand up and declare the word of God. That's what Jesus did. The flow was going in one direction. He reversed the flow in only a way that Jesus can do by sharing truth and love. But to understand what's happening today, I think is important. To face the ugly truth of what's happening is important. Not to bury our heads in the sand. <clears throat> to see it, if you will, from God's perspective, that's what I want right now. God, show me through your eyes what you're seeing in our nation today. So how did they really know what was happening? How did they really know what was happening? They were listening to God. The only way you're ever gonna know what's really happening, what's happening behind the scenes, what's happening behind the front that we see, what's happening behind the curtain, who's pushing all the buttons back there, What's, what, what, what we need to know to find out what's really happening is we need to be dialed into the Holy Spirit. We need to be dialed into God, listening to his voice each and every day so we know which way to go. We know what's happening, what's truth, what's false, what's a lie, what's the word of the Lord. We need that today, I believe as a church, I believe as a nation, more than we ever had before. I think it's something that's important. <clears throat> we need to see it from God's perspective. Because stuff is happening right before our very eyes. It's right before our very, are we gonna stand up? Bow down? Let it go? Bounce it off? What are we gonna do? We need to hear the voice of the Lord. The sons of Issachar understood the times that they were living in. They had, were listening to the voice of God. But I'll tell you this, there is a real live devil and he's orchestrating a master plan to try to just kill, steal, and destroy you and this nation and this world and everything in it. His joy and delight is to destroy, is to kill. Just like God likes to love and tell the truth, that's what he is. That's God's DNA is love and he tells the truth. The devil destroys and he tells lies. 
That's his DNA. Whatever he can do to get us to believe something that's not true, that's not of God, anything he can do, any slightly thing, however he can use it, he'll use your flesh, he'll use this, he'll use reasoning, he'll use logic, he'll use everything in his arsenal that he can to try to get you to believe something that you should not be believing. He's trying to destroy us. Understanding, the word understanding is yada. It means to know. It means ascertain by seeing. And I don't think it's just a seeing with our eyes. It's a seeing in the spirit. This is an Eastern, right? This is an Eastern aspect. They weren't just talking about natural sight. They were talking about seeing. They used to call them the prophets, seers who could prophesy, who could see what God was doing. They called them seers. We need seers that can see what God is doing, where God is at in the midst of everything that's happening. And we need God's perspective today. We need it desperately, like we need oxygen to breathe. We need the voice and the will and the heart of God. We need to be in this like we've never been in it before. We need to be hearing and seeing what is God saying? What is God doing? What does he want for me today? We need yada time. I remember a, a, a message was talking about yada time, meaning time with God. Time to know God, God to know you, and you to know what to do. We need it today. It also means understanding, wisdom, knowledge, meaning, wisdom. The word times here, understanding the times. The word times means Time. <laughs> Sounds like Pastor Joe, doesn't it? It was a very powerful. But I, but I thought this, especially now, especially the now, the idea of what, what's happening now, not what happened years ago or what's going to happen, what's happening now. He said we need to understand what's happening at this very moment, at this very juncture in our life. What's happening now, now, now. I believe that we're at a new time in American history. I think right now, right now, right now, it's very interesting. In the 1990s, 85% of the United States population claimed to be a Christian. Whether they were or not, I don't, you know, I mean, what type of a Christian is yet to be, would, would, you know, it's up in the air, but they claimed to be. Today, only 65% claim to be Christian. Only 65% of our population claims to be Christian. Of that, 41% of our American population go to church, 41%, and only 24% of our population goes regularly to church. Going to church for a lot of people is, well, I go once a year, and you know, I'm a good Bible-believing, born again Christian, well, that's probably difficult. <laughs> the idea of where are our values? What is important to us? I'm talking about Christians who are living out their faith. Live your faith. I love that slogan that Amir and Pastor Dan put together. Live your faith, you know? Living it. We need to be living it, faith. We need to be living it now more than ever. We're in a new time. We need to be understanding this time. What's it like to follow Jesus in a non-Christian secular society? Amen. That's where we're becoming. That's where we really are right now. We are a non-Christian secular society. We didn't used to be that. Everyone was Christian. I mean, I mean, everyone went to church. But it's not what it is today. 24%. <clears throat> What's it like to follow Jesus in a non-Christian, secular society? We need to understand that. What's it like to do that? What's it like to do that? We don't want to attach our convictions to a nationalistic perspective, but to a biblical perspective. Please hear me. I'm not... I love our country, I love our nation, I love all of that, but my faith, my, my what I do is not attached to the United States, it's attached to the Bible, and I'm trying to get the Bible into the United States. <clears throat> That's what we need to be attached to, the biblical perspective. 
What tells us what is right or wrong is not the majority, but the Bible. Well, but the majority, everybody here thinks that. Um, majority is becoming non-Christian, so that's what we're going to do. No, no, this is what the Bible says. This is our mandate. This is our mandate. <clears throat> we're living in a society where people call evil good and good evil. In Isaiah 5, 20, it says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. This word evil is the word raw. It means to spoil, to ruin, a breaking to pieces. It's not just... It's not just, the enemy is evil. The enemy is not just trying, oh, make it bad for you. He's trying to bust it, rip it apart. Remember, I remember when you had a kid, uh, um, you hear about the kid who's, who's, you know, he's got the toy and his brother wants a toy, he wants the toy, so he throws it down and busts it all over the place so nobody can have it. Ruins it all. It's like, well, why did you do that? Well, if I can have it, you can have it either. The idea of what the enemy wants to do, he wants to ruin your life. He wants to ruin society. He wants to ruin everything that he touches. He doesn't want to just make it bad, difficult, or hard. He wants to obliterate it. He wants to smash it to pieces. And we need to understand that. <clears throat> to make or be good for nothing. He wants it good for nothing. The word good here, who call evil good and good that word good is the word tob. It's the same word that God used in Genesis when he created the world and said, hey, this is good. This is good. Hey, this is good. Then he said, dang, I'm good. No, you're God. Of course you're good. They take that goodness of God, the goodness that God created, and the devil wants to ruin it, shatter it into pieces, completely destroy it. We need to understand that that is his goal. And we've had tons and tons of Christians holding it back. Now there's less and less, so it seems to be breaking through the lines more and more. <clears throat> we need to know what's going on in the spirit. We need to recognize that there's a real devil and we need to stand up. We need to be aware of his plan and not sucked into his plan. In Ephesians 6, 10 through 13, it says this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil. The wiles. The word there is methodia. It means travesty. Trickery. He has a method. You understand? The devil has a plan, a strategy. He's put together. Okay, I'll just do that. No, I don't want to get, I'm not going for the whole ball of wax right now. I'm just going to gain that, then I'm going to gain that, then I'm going to gain that, then I'm going to do that, then I'm going to do that. He's got a plan. He's got a strategy. In the same way God has a plan and a strategy for your life, the devil has a plan and a strategy for your demise. One has it for your life, the other one has it for your death. The word goes back in the lexicon means crafty scheming with the intent to deceive. He's trying to deceive you. The devil is scheming, strategically planning how to trap you, how to destroy you, how to ruin you, how to ruin a nation, how to ruin a world, how to ruin it all. Because that's what he does. That's who he is. I think that this is no joke. It's something that we need to take seriously and not nonchalantly. Well, yeah, there's a devil out there. We put a little mask on him for Halloween. He's got horns and, you know, and we chuckle. That's not what's there. It's the, it's the evil to destroy you while you're just giving over control one step at another, thinking and not realizing, where am I going? Where am I going? I believe that today we're being lulled to sleep and not seeing the ramifications of what the devil is setting up. Now hear me, hear me, hear me. I am not a conspiracy theory person at all, all right? That's not me. I'm not a gloom and doomer person. Oh my gosh, this guy is following everything. I'm a person, let me tell you what, regardless of what's going on, I'm gonna have fun and I'm gonna enjoy my life, all right? If you've been around me, you know that. What fun can we have here? <laughs> you know, if we're having to stack logs, over there, I'm going, how can we make this fun? Let's throw them. Yes, it's great. This is what guys do. They throw them to one another. Hey, catch, boom. Oh, hit you in the head. You should watch out next time. I'm just saying, I look for fun in everything. 
How can we make this fun? How can we make this exciting? How can we make this dynamic? Let's have a good time. We're living. Let's like it. So I'm not that person. Oh, my God. I'm not that person at all, but I am a realist. I'm looking going, hey, something's funny. Something's going on that I don't know should be going on right now. It doesn't think, seem like it's God doing. It seems like the devil is doing. And I don't want to hand it over to him because he's lying to me. I want to hear the voice of God and take a stand for what he wants me to do. Verse 12 here, and this is important. <clears throat> In Ephesians here, we're, we're to stand against the wiles of the devil, the devil, the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against people, but against principalities. That's what the devil has. Against powers. That's what he has. Against the rulers of the darkness of this age. Against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. We're, we're fighting against the devil. We're not fighting against people. <clears throat> this is very important. People are influenced by a spiritual force that's behind them and a lot of them are so deceived they don't understand that you're doing the work of somebody you shouldn't be doing the work of. Because they've bought into a lie that the devil has given them. But we need to understand, it's not that you wicked person, no, there's a wicked force behind them. I love this person, Jesus Christ died for this person. They're misguided, who's gonna help them? Well, it's hard, you know, they're so strong and they're, and maybe you start loving them and get a voice into their life and maybe you can help them. Maybe they need someone just to love the old bugger. <clears throat> Don't get mad at people. Get mad at the devil who's deceiving the people. Therefore, put on the whole armor of God and stand. We are in danger, I think, of being lulled to sleep and we need to wake up in America. We need to understand the times we're living in. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the armor of God. We need the power of God. We need the wisdom of God. We need to be in the word of God. We need to be listening to our God. That's what it's supposed to be like, normal, everyday Christianity, but even more so today. So they understood the times that they were living in, these sons of Issachar. But secondly, they knew what they ought to do. Whoa! That's awesome! They knew what steps they were supposed to take. They knew what was supposed to happen. They understood the times and they knew what to do. That's an amazing formula for great kingdom success. <clears throat> They knew what they were supposed to do. They knew what God wanted them to do. And it was not just going with the flow. Oh, yeah, be on earth, though. Just go with the flow. Don't worry, it'll all pan out somehow. No. They were supposed to carry their, their part of this baton a certain distance. All the prophets of the old... All of the, the men and women of the Bible have continued to carry this baton forward and forward and forward, and now it's in our hands, and now we need to do something with it. And I don't think it's drop it and realize, well, it doesn't matter, we're all gonna go to heaven someday. I think we're supposed to pick up the baton, and we're supposed to advance it to the next generation that needs to know the things of the kingdom of God in a powerful way. Why do you think I love children so much? They're our future! They're the next generation! We need to get them liking church, liking God, and understanding that God has a dynamic plan and a wonderful destiny for them. <clears throat> Throughout the Bible, we see people taking a stand for God and against the societal norms of the day, and it costs them too. How did they know what to do? How did these sons of Issachar know what to do? They were listening to God. <laughs> they understood the times because they were listening to God. They understood what they should do because they were listening to God. Do you think we ought to be listening to God today? Amen. The word new here is that same yada again. Ought to do, what they ought to do is to make or do. They knew what they were supposed to do and they did it. They knew what they were supposed to do. The way you change the world even if it's unpopular in your thoughts and ideas 
of what the world sees is the way that Jesus changed the world because he brought reform that was like, what, what, we don't get it, what are you saying? But he brought it because he brought it in love. He brought the truth in love. And it's still the way I believe today that we need to move forward, the truth in love. <clears throat> God has called us to follow the Bible, not a political party or a political agenda, but to follow what the Bible says about the topics of today. In this church, I have Democrats, I have Republicans, I have independents, I have people who could care less. We're not supposed to be divided, we're supposed to come together as Christians. Christians who love the Lord, who love what God's doing in the earth today. In Romans 12 too, it says this, <clears throat> and do not be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to this world. We're not to be like the world. We're not gonna go just with the flow. We are not to allow ourselves to be pulled, poured into the mold of the world. Listen to me. This is <clears throat> Suzanne's bowl for cereal. No, it's not. <laughs> this is a what bowl? A jello mold, a jello mold. When you take jello and you pour it in the mold and allow it to sit for a while, what happens? It becomes like the mold, does it not? Oh, we're just getting poured in, we're just getting poured in, and then we turn it around and all of a sudden we're just like the mold. And here's what the devil's doing. Next, here's your life. Next, this is the world's mentality. Here's the world's ideology. Next. Next, and we're just pouring ourselves into this mold, coming out just like the mold tells us we're supposed to come out. I don't wanna live by what a mold tells me I'm supposed to do. I wanna live by what the Bible tells me I'm supposed to do. It says, don't be conformed to this world. It's formed itself a certain way with certain ideologies, with certain rationales, with certain logics, with certain thoughts, with certain talking heads out there. And this is the mold that we're all supposed to get poured into. Not me. Amen. I want to be poured into this. Hallelujah. I want this poured into me. Yeah. And we need to realize it's so subtle of how we're being shaped into the mold of jello. We just wiggle now. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of standing up for something, hey, I don't think God said that. We just go, hey, I think it's okay. I think it's okay. People push us and we just, we just wiggle. Hey, how you doing out there, man? Hey, just wiggling. I think we're supposed to stand with some backbone and some fiber. And not let the world tell us what we're supposed to do, but let God tell us what we're supposed to do. Amen. We're supposed to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're supposed to get your mind. <laughs> so funny, I was at the football game. <clears throat> our kids <clears throat> went undefeated. Uh, our uh, uh, Mark, uh, our coach, uh, led the team amazingly. They uh, won all of their games. Uh, nobody ever scored on them all year long. Nobody ever scored on them. They won every single game. And uh, it was so funny, in the middle, it was a tough game this last one they played, they won six to zero. <clears throat> the very last game, one lady's on the sideline, and she's going, get your mind right! And I said, have you been talking to Amir? <laughs> really, it was like, I, thought, I just thought, wow, she's a disciple of Amir over there. <laughs> get your mind right! <clears throat> It was just so funny. It was so funny at the very end, you know, they got apple cider. They're like, you know, they're, I mean, it was a big deal for them. I mean, it was, it was, it was really, it was really awesome. I just, I just loved it. I love that they did a great, great job. <clears throat> Make sure that your mind is into the Bible. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Is that not what we're after? Or after the will of God, I don't want to be after the will of the world. I don't want to be jiggling. I want to be standing. And God's saying, hey, well done, thou good and faithful servant. 
Well done. Good job. Way to stand. Well, it wasn't easy. Yeah, I didn't think it was going to be easy. It's hard to take a stand, a loving stand. Let me tell in all of this, I'm, I'm, not, I'm after the idea of the way Jesus did it. He spoke the truth in love. He spoke it lovingly. 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 Amen. Let's be aware of the, the plans that the devil has and realize that God has a better plan. <clears throat> so I'm going to hit one issue before we end here. I got 10 minutes. No. I want, to, I want to talk about, and these are difficult things to talk about, okay? So please, please bear with me. Please bear with me. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to throw something out there, and I know there's different opinions everywhere. I'm trying to give some biblical thought, but I know that other people can think differently about this. I thought I'd pick the number one topic kind of in our paper today which is vaccine mandates. The mandates to be vaccinated. What did, what did we do with that? That's one thing that's kind of coming out. That's, they're telling us we must do that. Remember, the devil wants to divide us. Please don't let him. Some in this church right here that I'm speaking to right now are very adamant about taking the vaccine. Very adamant. Other people in here are very adamant about not taking the vaccine. And they're very adamant. I get that. I get that. I get that. I get that. Regardless, we need to understand that COVID is a reality and it's killing people, right? So it's a tragedy that we're having right now and we're having to try to figure out what we need to do. I'm trying to figure out what would Jesus do? You know, he didn't have shots back then, so he just, good for him. <laughs> so understanding the times, what are we to do? I'm personally... Not opposed to the vaccine. But I am, and I think, I think it's difficult, I am opposed to mandating that you have to take it, and if you don't, we're gonna take your job from you. I have a number of people in our church right now who've lost their jobs. They lost their jobs, or are getting ready to lose their jobs because they feel that it's important to them to exercise their conviction. I get that. I get that. I, I just, I think it's sad that people are losing something. I, I think that's sad. I know that there's different thoughts on this, okay? So I'm gonna try to get some perspective as we move. I think that's a little bit overreach when they, all of a sudden we're saying, we're gonna take your job. I, I, I think that's, that's, that's tough. And then, and then we, we're gonna take away your job and then we're not gonna give you any unemployment benefits. So now we got a person without a job and no way to support themselves, and I'm going, it, it starts to sound to me like it's hurtful. It's kind of like revengeful. I don't think that's kind. I don't think, that that's, I don't think that's caring. We're supposed to care for people. Our state is supposed to care for people. I think it's, I think it's just over, over the top. I, I'm, 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 I'm saddened. I'm saddened at our first responders, whether they be our health professionals or doctors or nurses or EMT or firefighters or policemen who, who we, 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 we stood there and we all applauded and we were so thankful that they stood in the gap and risked their lives for us. And now we're telling them, but we don't care about you anymore. Get, a, get, get lost. I think, that's, I think that's difficult for us as a nation to do, to, to do something like that. I, 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 think, it's, I think it's sad. I think it's, I think it's hard hitting. I think, I think for some people, I think they're nervous. I was uh, made aware of a person who has four family members. They have four family members and, and, and all of them got the vaccine and in getting the vaccine, they all had different responses to it. All of them negative. One person passed. That person, as you can imagine, is a little nervous. He's thinking, hey, I think it's fine for everybody out there. But some, some reason, my genetics <laughs> aren't working with this vaccine. And so, a little nervous. And I'm saying, I think that there are people out there who are, are scared. I think they're, they're nervous about it. They'd like to hear more of the science. Tell us what about everything about the science. Rather than what you want us to know about science, we'd like to hear all the science, the good and the bad. 
Tell us what we don't know. Tell us what we do know. Tell us what about those who, who have an immunity because they've gotten the virus. And it, does that help us at all? It, 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 they just like to know what's going on out there. But instead, it's, it's difficult for them. And so we're, we're forcing them. You take a scared person who's nervous about it and we're gonna force them into something. All they're gonna do is back out more. We need to put more understanding. Do we care? Do we care about either side here? I care about what they're thinking. Hey, people are dying. I care about that. I care about this person over here. Hey, he's going to die. He don't have a job. I, I, don't, I don't understand it. So what I'm saying is, I think we need to have compassion. I think we need to have compassion. People are nervous. They're scared. They just want honest answers to their questions, but don't feel, they feel like we're getting a political response to our questions. I, that's why I'm against that whole aspect. I just want somebody who doesn't care about being reelected or propagating a certain agenda, but really honest to God cared about the, the people in our nation and about doing good for them. But everything is suspect now because politics have played so much into everything. On both sides. On both sides. People are just scared. But instead of answering their questions or helping them along or, hey, buddy, let me just talk to you. Let's, we're going we're gonna to put them in a headlock. We're going to take this. I don't, I don't think that that's right as the nation that we are. I pray for someone to heal our nation, not further divide it. It will take God and it will take Christians telling the truth in love. I don't care what side you're on here. We need to rally together. We need to love one another. Because the enemy is doing a great job of getting us divided. Hey, hate them, hate them, hate them, hate them. Look what they're saying. I'm just saying, maybe we need a little more love and understanding toward one another. Instead of forcing one another, let's come, let's, let's care. I just wish some politician on one side or the other would go, I care about healing the nation. We say that. But nobody goes, what are your problems? Let me help you. Let me try to understand you. What are your problems? Let me try to understand you. Instead, each party goes, here's me. We're going to force that on you. Here's us, and we're going to force that on you. I'm just saying, maybe we ought to try to understand where people are coming from. A little bit. A little bit. For some, it's not, is the vaccine good or bad? For some, it's I have a religious conviction. I don't feel like God wants me to do this. I don't want to do this. They have a religious conviction, a personal religious conviction. And here's a good valid question. But doesn't the Bible say, follow our government leaders' mandates? Doesn't the Bible say that? Doesn't it say it in, first, or in Romans 13.1? Everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority comes from God and is and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. I think it's a valid point. In order to have a law-abiding society, we need to have laws. And then we need to obey those laws. And we need to enforce those laws. Because lawlessness, I believe, is of the devil. Lawlessness keeps us into corruption. It keeps us away from the things of God. So we need laws. We need to follow them. Unless they go against your convictions. Unless they go against something that you hold deeply. Or conviction, a fixed or firm belief. An unshakable belief in something. And I want to, since I have one minute now, give you four. <laughs> There's another thing the Bible talks about redeeming the time. Pretend like right now, it's just 11.30. It's only 11.30. I'm going to redeem these last 15 minutes. I'm going to, we're going to redeem these last 15 minutes, okay? So we're going to go quick. Four biblical illustrations of refusing to obey a mandate because of convictions. I'm just trying to understand. I'm not saying what's right and wrong. I'm saying I'm trying to understand. Trying to understand people. I, my job is to gather us as a flock together. Hey, we're in this together, all of us. My, my job is to bring unity amongst us. 
That's actually God's job, but I'm trying to hear his voice and going, how do we, how do we navigate through this, Lord? But there's four biblical illustrations of refusing to obey a mandate because of a person's convictions. Number one, Daniel, refusing the king's food because of his convictions. Daniel 5, or 1, 5, and the king appointed for them daily provisions of the king's delicacies and of wine which he drank and three years of training for them so that at the end of the time they might serve before the king. But in verse 8, but Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies. For him, he didn't want that in his body. <laughs> he didn't want it. That's just where he was at. Now with the wine which he drank, therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. He asked, I don't want to do this. And he didn't. And the result was they were 10 times better than all the other people and all the things that they were eating. Powerful thing. But he, he stood against the king, the mandate that was given. Secondly, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refusing to worship the golden statue because of their convictions. Nebuchadnezzar, he, 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 he builds a statue, a golden statue, nine feet wide and 90 feet tall, and he tells everybody, hey, when you hear the music playing, I need you to bow down, I need you to worship that statue. That's what we do. That's what our society is doing today. That's what we all agree upon. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm mandating. Whenever the music plays, fall down and worship. But they didn't. They wouldn't do it. They said no. <clears throat> they said they're not going to do that. And in verse 16, three, <clears throat> Daniel 3, 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up, saying, God will take care of us, and even if he doesn't, we still ain't going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I know it's the mandate. I know what we're supposed to all do, but I'm not going to do it. The king was mad. He makes the, the, you know the story, the furnace seven times hotter. People were getting burned up just as they threw in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then to the king's surprise, remember, they threw in three, but then they see four and one who looks like the son of man. Jesus was in the midst of the flames with them. They took a stand for what they felt were their convictions against the mandates of the day. <clears throat> Number three, Daniel refusing not to worship God refusing not to worship God because of his convictions. Here was the mandate in Daniel 6, verse 7. Whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish a decree, a mandate, and sign it in writing so it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written mandate, the, the decree, so he wasn't supposed to worship. That's what they said. For 30 days, you can't do that. You know, Daniel, he's saying, ah, I don't care. I've been, I've, been, I've been praying to the Lord three times a day all of my life. I am not quitting now. I don't care what it costs me. I'm not going to follow the mandate. And he doesn't. He follows his convictions. He's thrown into a den of lions. And God shuts their mouth. And lastly, We'll go New Testament. Peter and the apostles refusing to stay silent about the gospel because of their convictions. This was the law of the land. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest asked them saying, did we not strictly command, mandate you not to teach in this name, in the name of Jesus? And look, you have, fulfilled, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, and, and I love this because honestly, it's like the sons of Issachar. They knew what they ought to do. Remember what they ought to do? We ought. We, we understand the times. I understand what's going on right now. I understand what the government's trying to do to regulate all of our sharing and all of our witnessing. I understand what they're doing here, but we ought to. We ought to. What God is asking us to do is to obey God rather than man. So again, regardless of where you are on this, 
I think that we need to show love and compassion as we move forward. We need to realize that people, Christians, what they see from the scripture, what they see God asking them to do is not. That's kind of the right of being American. You can choose. I think it's difficult, the price that they're paying. I think it's, I think it's sad. I think it's really sad. And we say, well, it's just a mandate, do it. But what about the next mandate? What about the next mandate that comes that says, hey, um, really, we don't want you reading that. It's divisive. It's causing problems. So we don't want you to, we don't want you to read that anymore. Or maybe they're saying, you know what? <clears throat> We don't want you believing this Bible. We don't want you preaching what it says because some of this, we call it hate speech now. You're, you're, you're talking against sin. And, and, and some of that talk is making people uncomfortable. And by the very nature of them feeling uncomfortable, therefore it's hate speech. It's happening in other, in other countries. I'm just saying, where do we finally say, hey, wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. What was valued in America as the land of the free and the home of the brave, is it fast becoming the land of the forced and the home of the behaved? We're forced to do something and then ask, just behave, fall in line. Regardless of where you are on this issue, I think we need to understand that we all must follow what the Lord is speaking to us. And we need to give the people that right to do so. Remember that people are just nervous. They're in a chokehold. Let's help them. Let's encourage them. Let's explain. Let's, let's dig deeper into science. If science is really true, let's get the honest to goodness science that's out there. We just need to know the truth. Because the truth will set us free. Amen. Let me conclude. What's happening? <laughs> que pasa? A lot of different things. But, oh God, make us like the sons of Issachar. And again, regardless of what you believe, I just pray that we become a son of Issachar that says, I want to seek the Lord. I want to hear his voice. I want to understand the time that we're living in. I want to understand exactly what the Lord is asking me to do. I want to know what he wants me to do. And then I want to have the courage and the guts and the power of the Holy Spirit to stand and to do that and to do it with great love, just like Jesus would have done it. Just like Jesus would have done it. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Father, I pray for our nation. It doesn't need more division. It needs healing. You also say that you'll heal our land if we'll repent. And Lord, we need to repent of our sin. We ask you, Father, even our own personal, help us in our relationship with you to continue to walk as a holy and righteous people before you, doing your will, doing it your way, because we love you. Father, help us as Christians to not be dogmatic and not preachy and not mad and hateful, but loving, Lord, and to stand and declare the truth, but with such great love and compassion. Because that, Lord, is how you changed the world when you were walking here. So help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. We need you. We need you. We need you. We want you, Lord. Continue to speak to us. Continue to guide us. Continue to love us. And Father, I pray that you would help me and Carrie, our leadership team, to lead with compassion and love, to lead with grace, to lead with understanding, and to lead, Lord, as you would want us to. We love you. We bless you. 
And we thank you for being so, so good to us, Lord. It's in that wonderful and precious name of Jesus Christ that we pray. I love you, Lord. I love you guys. God bless you.